Welcome to Go Solo Live. Don't you mean Go Solo Live? Have you ever been asked, why on earth would you travel alone? Go Solo Live not only answers that question, but celebrates life as a midlife solo traveler. This is a safe place for women to come together to reminisce about their travels, encourage others to travel, and to dig into the real lessons learned from these journeys. Now join Jennifer Buchholz with Transform Via Travel as she and her guests share stories of the solo travelers of midlife women. Welcome to Go Solo Live. This is Jennifer with Transform Via Travel. We are in our special season of our podcast, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Mary Travelbest. Welcome to this edition of Dr. Mary Travelbest's Independent Travel Guide. This is for women who travel, who want to travel, and especially for those who want to travel independently. Are you a woman and do you travel? What's on your bucket list? Please share all of that with me. You can tell me via social media, blog, or any way you like. I'm all ears. I'm going to talk to you about your FAQs and your special travel questions, as well as share some of my mistakes and missteps in travel, because I've made just about every mistake, so you don't have to. I wrote the world's first guide to independent travel in 1993, and since then, I've been running a business, raising four children with my husband, and been a professor at several universities, all the time traveling and making many mistakes along the way. So my travel experiences are rich and meaningful, and I want to share them with other women like you, so you get it right. In this episode, I want to talk to you, first of all, about your question. And then, as I mentioned, I'll talk about some destinations, mistakes, and advice. So here's the question. I want to travel solo for several weeks, but my current job only gives me two weeks paid vacation per year. I'm comfortable with working on the go and can use the tools without being in the office. What should I do? I can relate to this question because in America, in the United States, that is a traditional vacation schedule, two weeks, and it's really not enough time. I always struggled with that amount of vacation time and It is a phenomenon that isn't seen in too many other countries. So if you want to keep your current job and you want to maximize your time off, one of the things you could do is talk to your boss, talk to your supervisor, talk to the person who makes the decisions and tell them your situation and just be upfront about it and say, it's not working for me because I know that I can be so much more productive and so much more energetic and do so much better for this organization if I XXX. So that's up to you to kind of draw that story out. It's possible that your company would be willing to negotiate with you. For example, maybe you take those weeks without pay, or maybe you take certain weekends off and you stretch out those weekends and work extra time during the weeks so that you can maximize and earn more vacation time. And maybe you can get it up to three or four weeks a year. And then you could take a really, really great trip. Now you mentioned here that you have the ability to work on the go and you can use the tools. Well, because so many of us are digital nomads these days, the job opportunities for people on the go have really multiplied. And you could work while you're traveling in a virtual way. So there's companies like Upwork and there's companies that will give you an opportunity to work part-time or work virtually. There could be a VA and you could figure out how an income still could be made working the hours that you want to. One example is teaching. So if you're a teacher and you have the accessibility to Wi-Fi and you can teach a class online, well, this could be a great opportunity for you to still earn money while you're traveling and keep your job. So there's a few options for you, and I hope that is helpful to you. Of course, quitting your job is always an option. This is something I did way, way back because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do this ever again. So when I was young, I took that risk and I made the choice and it worked out well for me but it might not be the same for you. So everybody's situation is different. Okay, so today's independent destination, we're gonna talk about Alaska. 
Alaska, Alaska, Alaska. So the 50th state or the 49th state, just one of the last states back in the 1950s. And it's very close to Russia, geographically speaking. So you've got some beautiful nature to see in Alaska. The question is, how do you get there? Is like everybody else, you going to go on a cruise? And you certainly could do that independently, book a cruise and even find a last minute cruise maybe and go out. But tell you how I first went to Alaska and I'll tell you how I'm going to go next. I went with my husband to be and his father. And that was in 1993, 1994, uh, right in the end of June, early July. And we booked a round trip flight to Anchorage and we had a few hotel reservations, rented a car and then explored the Kenai Peninsula. We went fishing for halibut, which was deep sea fishing. And we also went fishing for salmon, which was in the river. It was not on a tour. We pretty much did this on our own. We hired our own guides and booked our own trips. And we were able to go to places that probably most tourists don't go see. I do recall that there was a whole lot of rain almost every day. One of the other memories is the national bird of Alaska was the mosquito. So that is definitely uh, something to consider. We went to Denali National Park. This was definitely one of the highlights. So one out of four days, you will have visibility of the peak. It used to be Mount McKinley, but now it's Denali. And if you have a chance to venture in, it's really worthwhile. It's a long trip in. It's about a 10 to 12 hour trip, as I recall. And you have to book this in advance. But it is definitely worth going to. And it's on a school bus. So you're not talking about a luxury type of a cruise uh, adventure. But if you have a chance to go to Denali National Park, go ahead. So if you're going to Alaska, if you're thinking this is an adventure that I'm up for, and it's rustic, I have to tell you, it's not the luxury travel, but independent women, you should be able to take advantage of great airfares. And especially if you want to go maybe low season, because the peak season is June, July, and August. So June is spring, July is summer, and August is fall. The rest of the year is winter. One of the best memories that I have is being at Homer, Alaska. And if you've ever listened to a commercial for the Motel 6, Leave the Lights On, that's really kind of what it felt like. We were down at the very, very tip of the Kenai Peninsula, and it was called Land's End. It was literally the end of the road, and it was July 4th, and it was night, 1130 at night. I'm lying on the beach, and I'm looking up at the sky, and I'm seeing fireworks. Yeah, I could actually see fireworks, even though it looked like it was daytime. So if you have a chance to be there and see that the sun almost never sets because you're so close to the North Pole, it's just pretty amazing. Go to Homer if you can, go to Land's End, go out and visit the Kenai and see some of the nature. So there's certainly a lot more to see than Alaska. So we're going back and this is 2019. So we're going back for our 25th wedding anniversary and we're going to take our two sons. So we're going to explore some of the same places. One of the things we did was we looked into a rental car and for the two weeks, the rental car is $2,500. That's right. Yes, you heard it. I thought, you know, well, you could buy a car for that. So what we're doing is we are going to rent a car from two miles away from the airport. And that saves us $1,000. Now, stay tuned because I'll give you some more information. How did that work out? But we're going to get a minivan and we're going to be able to sleep in it if we need to. We have some hotels booked or Airbnbs, one night here, one night there. But we do plan to go to Fairbanks and then drive kind of the whole loop throughout the southern part of uh, Alaska and back to Anchorage, including the Kenai. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that as time goes on. Uh, I'd love to hear if you've been to Alaska. Did you go on a cruise? What was your experience? Did you book it independently? I'd love to, uh, to find out more. So let's go to today's mistake or misstep. So one of the uh, things that was a mistake, and I'll talk about Alaska, was getting soaked and frozen while fishing. So the salmon fishing was an experience where you have to buy a license. And that license, you can go to like a 7-Eleven and buy it. And it was not cheap. It was like 
50 or $60, as I recall, and you could only get one salmon. So we got in the water at 6 a.m. And our plan was to be in the water until about one o'clock that day. So it was like a five hour fishing trip. And at 6.05, my husband snagged his salmon and was able to grab it and pick it in, bring it in the boat. It was a big fight and it was in. But for the next five hours and 55 minutes, we caught nothing but a cold. So if you are going to be on a boat, be sure that you have absolutely the right comfort equipment that's going to keep you dry and warm. So that was a mistake of mine, not being prepared. I was ready to get out of that boat at about hour number three, but we stayed. And so that was an experience getting, getting frozen, getting soaked. So if you are fishing in Alaska, even if it's the summer, just be sure that you're going to stay dry if you can. So let's talk about travel advice. I interviewed Yumi Cho. She's in the San Diego Symphony. She's a violinist. And she's from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And she went on a trip by herself to the Everest Base Camp. She's a solo traveler. She's a really gung-ho person. And I really enjoyed talking to her about her trip. She researched it and she couldn't find anybody to go with because none of her friends really seemed to be interested. So she picked a really, really low season. And it was over Christmas and uh, she and a male guide went on this trip to Everest Base Camp. One of the things that she had that really hurt her was altitude sickness. So if you are ever traveling on a long distance and you're at an altitude, you know, be really careful about altitude sickness. Uh, She happened to have a really bad cold and, and she was miserable But since she doesn't really, you know, like organized trips, she likes her own adventure, she went for it. And she did it solo. Again, she was a female, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And she talked about how she stayed in a hut. And uh, this was, you know, 2015. It was near Kathmandu and things like, you know, slow Wi-Fi and very poor communications were definitely a challenge. Uh, She also talked about the need for appropriate weather uh, equipment, as I had mentioned before. So that's that's something to think about. If you've ever thought about going to the Everest Base Camp, that could be quite an adventure. Maybe that's somewhere you want to go. If you book it like she did on trust, and then you take what you get, it could turn out to be a great trip. A lot of it depends on your expectations. So if you've always wanted to go on a trip and you're afraid to, some advice from Dr. Travelbest, myself, and from you and me, Cho, are to go for it. Now, a couple of things that you, me, and I talked about in a recent interview about how to be a good independent traveler. And one of the things that you, me, and I talked about was trying not to look like a tourist. So how do you do that? If you are a tourist, you're a target. And we definitely need to be safe. So Whatever you can do to kind of blend in, wearing the right clothes, looking the, the part, kind of feeling your way around beforehand, following tips that people tell you that you trust, being aware, finding a person to check in with at the end of the day. These are kinds of things to know about. If you're in a large crowded area, you've got to be aware of pickpockets. So uh, Yumi, for example, was in a subway in Athens, Greece, and she did not zip her pocket and her phone was stolen in just a few seconds. Now, if you're carrying a backpack, one of the things you can do is wear it in front of you, and zip pockets are the best. Don't carry large amounts of cash, don't have a wallet, and a money belt under your clothing can feel bulky, but you can do kind of a crossbody belt, and you can put your passport and things like that in there. So carry kind of the least amount of cash possible If you have a chance, you might want to look into the global entry card. So this is something that I did last year. I went to get an appointment at my airport in San Diego and picked up the global entry card. The cost was $100 and it was for five years. And what it does is it lets you skip the lines when you're coming back into the U.S. That saved me about two hours coming in from Asia recently. It also gives you Century Pass when you're coming up from Mexico. So that was a a really good thing. Today's travel, we talked about Yumi. And now I want to talk a little bit about bringing some meaning to your travel. And I want to share with you a little bit about Taipei, Taiwan. I was in Taiwan 
30 years ago, and again, there this year. So what are some things to do in Taiwan? Well, first of all, where is it? It's off the coast of China. It used to be called Formosa. So you may have even heard of that. Taipei is the capital city, and there is so much to do in Taiwan. I believe it's really undervalued and one of those destinations that is really worth looking into. People want to go to China, the mainland, but most times they don't think about going to Taipei. So I want to share a few great places to go if you're interested in seeing something independently. Now, a lot of people speak English there. We got along really well. One of the things we did was go to the night market. And so I did this 30 years ago and I did it again this year. The Shinlin night market is one of the easiest to find if you're in Taipei. It's really a convenient MRT, which is their subway system distance away. And then when you're, when you're in the neighborhood, you can also go during the daytime to the Palace Museum. So the Palace Museum has all the relics that were brought over from the mainland back in 1948 when Chiang Kai-shek left China. And so the Palace Museum has the real treasures of mainland China. So if you have a chance, go to the Palace Museum. It's really spectacular. A few more things about Taiwan to see. This is really a fun restaurant called the Ice Monster. Now, remember that, Ice Monster. You go in there with a large group or even just yourself, and you just meet people and have a wonderful, wonderful experience of eating this delicious ice cream that they make. And I don't know how they make it, but we had flavors that were so unusual. Coffee and pistachio and strawberry and banana and all kinds of really, really special flavors. So look for the Ice Monster restaurant if you're in Taipei. Another thing to do if you're in the area is Jiufin, and that's a kind of a, a fishing village not too far from Taipei. Now, back in Taipei, in the city itself, uh, you can go to the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, which I did back then and now. And then nearby, kind of like a, uh, a central park, is called Dan Park, D-A-A-N Park. And then there's also a nice little market nearby called Dangan. We also took some trips to Taoyuan, which is where the airport is in Taipei. It's actually about 20 miles away, but Taoyuan is really a nice destination for a day trip. And then if you want to take some other day trips away from the city of Taipei, you can go to the Yangmin National Park, where we did some naked sulfur baths. So that was an interesting experience. A few other places we did through Taipei were like New Taipei City and uh, Beitou. So those are some travel experiences in Taipei, Taiwan. And I hope that this is going to bring meaning to your travel. This is Dr. Mary Travelbest. Thank you for listening to this edition of the World's First Guide to Independent Travel. If you want to know more, just search for me. And sure enough, you'll find me on the web, social media, and in podcast form. I'm looking for you. So go ahead and let me know what's on your bucket list.